Well, I titled my talk tonight, It Is Not Finished. And as you may have guessed by my title, I'm throwing in the towel. I can't take it anymore. The criticism is too much. The merit mongers win. I recant everything that I have said. I'm jumping off the grace train. I am now committing myself to a brand new message called Jesus plus you equals everything. I mean, seriously, what was I thinking? God's love does depend on how well you're doing. Uh, you, not Jesus, determine whether God likes you or not. Your righteousness is required, so you better not screw it up. You have skin in the game, and after all, your holiness deserves some credit, okay? So I'm, I'm changing. Tonight is the night, okay? I'm changing everything. I'm changing my message from it is finished to do more, try harder, get better, or else. That's my new message. From this point forward, I am now going to become a fear mongerer whose sole purpose in preaching is to cause you to wonder whether you're really saved or not. That way, the people who don't like me will start believing that I may actually be orthodox after all. Just kidding. <laughs> In the words of my hero, Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Um, and if they exile me to the Isle of Patmos, I will preach this to the trees. I have a feeling, however, that I will not be alone that if they exile me, they will exile you, and I can promise you there will be a party like this world has never seen on whatever island they exile us to. So um, it gives me great comfort to know that I am not in this alone. And as Eric Metaxas was saying earlier today, um, there is a cost involved. There was a cost for Jesus, there was a cost for many of our early church fathers. There was a cost to Martin Luther. There was a cost to the Apostle Paul. There is a cost to this. The flesh is bitterly resistant to it is finished. And it will fight and it will claw. Our greatest disagreements and arguments are not theological in nature, they are spiritual. We are, not, we are not warring against flesh and blood and this particular argument versus this particular argument. We are warring against the world, the flesh, and the devil, which shouts all at the same time and in unison, it is not finished. And so, liberate exists as Rob was saying earlier, to say one thing 10,000 different ways. We are not interested in any way, shape, or form in saying 10,000 different things. We are interested in saying one thing over and over and over and over and over again in 10,000 different ways. I actually chose the title, It Is Not Finished, as a way of talking about a crucial distinction that has absolutely changed my life. The way I understand God, the way I understand myself, the way I understand others, the way I read the Bible. We talk a lot around here about the vital importance of distinguishing law and gospel, that God speaks two words. He speaks a word of demand and he speaks a word of deliverance. He diagnoses us and he delivers us. That the law may show us what love looks like, but the law in and of itself cannot produce love. Only grace can do that, only the gospel can do that. I was saying in a panel discussion uh, yesterday, I, all these days are running together in my head now, it was yesterday, I think, um, or maybe it was the day before, it was yesterday, um, that no one in the history of humanity has ever fallen in love with another person because that other person has looked at them and said, love me. No one. We fall in love when someone looks at us and says, I love you. 
Well, that's the same thing as saying the law cannot produce love. Even Jesus' commandment where he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The issuing of that command itself does not produce what it demands. First John tells us what does. We love him because he first loved us. Love, not law, begets love. And so we understand the crucial distinction between the law and the gospel. But tonight I want to talk about another distinction, another vital distinction. The distinction between what Martin Luther called passive righteousness and active righteousness. This is a game changer. At least this was a game changer for me. This distinction was just as much of a game changer for me as the distinction between law and gospel. You see, Martin Luther said that Christians live on two planes. Before God, vertically, coram Deo, Latin for before God, and before one another, horizontally, or we can say it in Latin if you want to impress your friends, coram mundo. So we live on two planes, before God, and before one another. And he said, our righteousness before God is passive. We receive that. We are receivers of that righteousness. Our righteousness before one another is active. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. The passive righteousness of faith or vertical righteousness is what makes us right before God fully and finally. The active righteousness of good works, or what we can call horizontal righteousness, is done in service to our neighbor. So if I were to retitle this sermon, it would be, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does, okay? Or as the Lutheran theologian Robert Kolb said, good works are for the purpose of serving our neighbor in creation, not God in salvation. We may say, for instance, that we don't believe in justification by works, theologically. We may say any good Protestant would deny the fact that we can justify ourselves by our works. Ephesians 2 is as plain as day, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves is a gift of God so that nobody can boast. So we know that our good works don't get us into heaven or get God to love us. We will say that theologically, but to say theologically we don't believe in justification by works does not mean that every single person in this room does not believe in justification by works functionally. We all do every single one of us. We may not be guilty of affirming justification by works theologically. All of us are guilty of believing in justification by works functionally. Um, and the reason this distinction is so helpful is because when we typically think of good works, we think of them in terms of things that we must do to keep God happy with us. So I'll give you an example. Uh, 21 years old, brand new Christian, God rescued me out of a life of debauchery, and uh, the hound of heaven tracked me down and magnificently defeated me and raised me from death to life, and I was a brand new creation, and I knew that it was important for my life to change from what it used to be to what it needs to be. And so I put in place all sorts of spiritual disciplines. Bible reading, I got a Bible reading plan. Uh, I started journaling, uh, early morning prayer. I mean, everyone knows, and i do not not exactly sure where it is in the Bible, but everyone knows that God hears our prayers better if we wake up before six in the morning. So I decided that I was gonna become an early riser because holy people rise early, and I was going to pray. And I wasn't just going to pray simple sentence prayers. I was going to pray for at least 60 minutes every morning, and I was going to read three chapters in the Bible. That's the way you can make your way through the Bible in the course of a year. And I wasn't just going to pray for an hour before 6 a.m., and I wasn't just going to read three chapters of the Bible, but I was also going to journal everything God was teaching teaching me every single day of the year. And, you know, as a young, zealous Christian, I, I was pretty good at that. 
I imposed, by the way, all of those disciplines on my new wife at the time, um, who, you know, this is kind of a funny story. I would suggest that we pray before we go to bed. And um, it wasn't good enough that we would lay in bed and pray together because everybody knows that God hears our prayers much better if we get on our knees. So uh, she was pregnant with our first child, Gabe, and uh, it was late, she would get tired. My wife, Kim, she would get tired early. Uh, and I would say, it's time to pray. And she would put on a good game face like she wanted to, when in reality, all she wanted to do was fall asleep because she was tired. And so I would suggest that she get on her knees the way that I was already on my knees. And I would say, why don't you pray first? And so she would pray and um, she would pray for, you know, four or five minutes, and I would kind of look at her, give her the eye, like, that's it, that's all you got. <laughs> so she was a new Christian, too. She didn't grow up in a Christian home. She didn't really know what this is all about. I was the expert, of course, because I grew up in a Christian home. I was Billy Graham's grandson, after all. I knew everything. Um, and so she would continue to pray, and then it was my turn, and I would pray, and I would pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. And when I would finally say, in Jesus' name, amen, I would look across the bed, and of course, Kim was sound asleep. And I would gently remind her of that time that Jesus asked his disciples to pray. and they fell asleep. So I wasn't just imposing this stuff on me, I was imposing this stuff on her and thinking that it was the ideal for every Christian that existed. And this is what was going on with me, and this is why this distinction is so functionally important. I actually believed that on the days when I would get up early and read three chapters in my Bible and pray for an hour and journal, that God liked me better. And on those days when I hit the snooze button a few times and I got up late and I didn't have time to read three chapters in the Bible, so I would read maybe three verses in the Bible, and I didn't have time to pray for an hour, so I would pray for maybe three minutes while I was in the shower, and I would skip a day of journaling, I was convinced for the rest of that day that God was annoyed with me. That God liked me better on the day before when I got up early and read more and prayed more and journaled, and he actually liked me less on the days when I was spiritually slacking. This is the funny thing. The crazy thing was that I actually believed that I had good spiritual days. I actually believed that reading three chapters in the Bible and journaling and praying for an hour was impressive to God, that that was a good spiritual day, that there were days I was pulling it off. My problem was, as you've heard me talk about before perhaps, I had a very low view of the law, that I thought it would satisfy God's requirements for me if I would simply read my Bible and pray, and the whole idea of be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect was cheapened to just read your Bible and pray and do your best and God will do the rest, okay? Um, what I failed to understand at that point was that the law is much heavier and much more impossible than that, and that even our tears of repentance need to be washed in the blood of Jesus. That's how messed up we are. As my friend Rod Rosenblatt said today in our panel discussion, all of our repentance is half-assed, okay? Lutherans, you know, they cuss and smoke. <laughs> That's why I love them. Um, uh, but he's right. There is something to be pardoned in even our best works. That's how high and lofty God's demands are, and that's how messed up we are. And so I was actually deluded back then into believing that I had good spiritual days. But the worst part, actually, was the fact that I believed, I really believed at a functional level that on those days when I was behaving well and doing those things that I thought were impressive to God, God liked me and was proud of me. 
And on those days when I was tired and slacking and lagging behind that God liked me less. All of the lifestyle instruction parts of the Bible were taught to me as if these were there for us to do in order to retain God's favor. Do you understand that that is primarily the way those things are taught? It may not be explicitly stated, but you've heard those sermons, you've read those books, you hear it in a way that when you are given those lifestyle instructions from the Bible, they, you, you leave with the impression that these exist as ways for me to observe in order to retain God's favor. And so the Bible for me became a moralistic handbook and God's disposition toward me was riding on my doing of these things, okay? But this is the problem. That perspective, that kind of thinking about God and that kind of reading the Bible undermines what the Bible clearly says about things between us and God being forever settled because of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. When we imply that our works are for God and not our neighbor, we perpetuate the idea that God's love for us is dependent on what we do instead of on what Jesus has done. When we, when we think that good works, the good works that are described for us plainly in the Bible, when we think that those good works are for God, that we need to do those things in order to keep God liking us and loving us, that we need to do those things in order to maintain God's favor, um, then we perpetuate this idea, not only to ourselves, but to others, that God's love for us is dependent on what we do instead of what Jesus has done. Listen to me, we cannot use what the Bible says about good works to renegotiate our acceptance with God. Okay? We cannot use what the Bible says about good works to renegotiate our acceptance with God. Or as my friend Scott Clark in California says, uh, we cannot use our doctrine of sanctification to renegotiate our justification. But that's what we do. That's what we do. We say, theologically, that justification precedes sanctification. But you know how you live? You know how I live? We live as if our sanctification precedes our justification. That's the way we live. We may never say that theologically, but that's the, way, that's the way we live. Listen, any talk of sanctification which leaves the impression that our efforts secure more of God's love needs to be put to death. Okay, any talk of sanctification which leaves the impression that our efforts secure more of God's love and favor needs to be put to death. It needs to be mortified. We always need to be reminded that good works are not a transaction with God. They are for others. So listen, life after justification does not eliminate good works. It just horizontalizes them. Okay, life after justification does not eliminate good works. You don't just throw those things out, but it puts them on a different plane. It horizontalizes them so that those good works are now descriptions of how we love our neighbor and have nothing to do with the way God loves us, the way God sees us, or how much God likes us, that he likes us better on our good spiritual days as if we ever had one, and he likes us less on our bad spiritual days. Um, I mean, we... <laughs> But this, this is what people say. Um, but doesn't everything being forever fixed between God and us flatten our relationship with God? And the answer is gloriously, yes. Yes. It absolutely flattens our relationship with God. God doesn't experience relational ups and downs when it comes to us. But that's the way we're led to believe. You know, I actually had a friend one time who was no longer a friend um, <clears throat> say, if you keep saying this stuff, um, if you keep saying this stuff, it will leave the impression 
with people that their relationship with God is flat. And I said, isn't it? Isn't our relationship with God gloriously flat? As if a flat relationship is a bad thing. Let me tell you something. If a flat relationship with God, where God doesn't experience relational ups and downs with you, if a flat relationship with God is a bad thing, how do you, ex- how do you explain heaven? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, at the very least, you have to admit that when we get to heaven, our relationship with God will be flattened. But heaven's better than here. So, I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to in some way downplay the flatness of God's relationship to us. Yes, our relationship to God is gloriously flat, and that's good news because we don't experience that kind of relationship with anybody else. Every single one of our relationships horizontally is up and down. It's up and down. We live in a conditional world, and we are conditional people, We are broken people living in a broken world with other broken people, and one of the chief marks of brokenness is conditionality. I mean, God may say, I will forgive you 70 times seven, but will your husband say that? Will your wife say that? Are there things you can do over and over and over and over again? And the people in your life that you go to and confess these things to or say sorry to, I mean, how many times have we heard it? You've said that before, okay? I mean, show me that you're different. Show me. What does God say? Over and over and over and over and over again. I forgive you. One of the devil's greatest lies is that God gets annoyed with our repetitive going, our repeatedly going back to him and asking for forgiveness. Okay, so all of our relationships here are up and down, up and down. That is a mark of brokenness. Okay, that is, that's not a, you and I both know that the ups and downs of our relationship are not a freeing thing. Uh, Our relationship with God is gloriously flat. It's unlike any other relationship that we experience on this earth. It is flat. So when we understand that everything between God and us has been fully and finally made right, it helps us understand what good works are and who good works are for. Okay, remember what I said, life after justification does not eliminate good works, it horizontalizes them. So now good works are not things needing to be done in order to get God's favor or to settle accounts with God. Good works are done in service to our neighbor. Good works that we find in the Bible, that we find described in the Bible, are works that we are doing for our neighbor, for those who are in need and those sorts of things. So forever freed from our need to pay God back or secure God's love and acceptance, we are now free to love and serve others. And Paul describes the free life, the Apostle Paul describes the free life as a life of self-forgetfulness. So if you were to outline the book of Romans, for instance, the first part of Romans is the diagnosis section where, I mean, Paul is diagnosing the entire human race and culminates his diagnosis by saying, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. I mean, everyone is in the same boat. The the playing field has been leveled because all of us have fallen short of God's standard of perfection. And then for about eight chapters, he follows that diagnosis section with a deliverance section where he waxes eloquent about the radicality of the gospel and he introduces us to amazingly mysterious words like justification and adoption and election and all of those things where we learn perhaps for the first time about the one wayness of God's love, that God rescues single-handedly bad people because bad people are all that there are. I mean, God loves, we find out in that section of Romans, God loves bad people because bad people are all that he has to choose from, okay? 
He loves weak people because weak people are all that he has to choose from. So we find that out in that. We're just blown away. Our minds are blown. Those are some of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. Romans 8, the great eight, in my opinion, is the greatest chapter in the Bible. James Montgomery Boyce, who was longtime pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and died in the fall of 2000, said that Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, is not just the central verse for Romans 8. It's not just the central verse for the book of Romans, but it's the central verse of the entire Bible. The great eight, what a remarkable chapter, a chapter in the Bible that I have to go back to all the time to be reminded that there is nothing, absolutely nothing I can do or fail to do that will keep God from loving me. Nothing because of what Jesus has done. So we get through the diagnosis section, we get to the end of chapter three in Romans and we feel the weight of our inability and we feel crushed by the fact that we have fallen short of what God requires, and we're supposed to feel that way when we get to the end of Romans chapter three, and then Paul comes in in Romans four and just delivers good news over and over and over again, and then we get to Romans chapter 12, which is what I call the description section. That goes from diagnosis to deliverance to description, and there Paul begins to describe what freedom on the ground looks like what it feels like, what it smells like, what does it look like, what does a life begin to look like that's been set free? And he he gives these instructions and we, we turn those instructions, whether we intentionally do this or not, we turn those instructions into something that we need to do in order to keep God liking us. But that's not why they're there. Those instructions are there to describe for us and to direct us into a deeper understanding of what freedom on the ground looks like. And he basically, over a period of four chapters, describes the free life as a life of self-forgetfulness. You you don't need anything anymore. (laughs) All of the love and all of the approval and all of the acceptance And all of the worth, all of the value, all of the significance that you long for and that you look for in a thousand different places and people that are smaller than Jesus are already yours in Christ. So now, now that everything I need and long for in Christ I already possess, I am free to give everything to you without needing anything from you. Okay, that's freedom. That is exactly what freedom is. It's the freedom of self-forgetfulness. I no longer have to fight, and you know life feels heavy when you feel like you have to fight to get to the front, when you have to fight to get on top, when you have to fight to get recognized, that if you don't get the respect and the recognition that you long for, then you won't feel validated. You won't feel justified as a human being. If you don't fight for the love that you long for, if you don't fight for the value and the worth that you crave, then you will live a meaningless life and all of those things. That doesn't, that's a life of bondage. That's not a life of freedom. A life of freedom is I don't need anything. So now I am set free to think about what you need, because I don't need anything. Everything I need in Christ, I already possess. So because of that, and that's what passive righteousness is, because everything I need in Christ, I already possess. That's passive righteousness. We're, We're passive in receiving it. We've been given everything we need by God. I am now free to do everything for you. That's active righteousness without needing you to do anything for me. And this is what Paul was getting at when he says in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith, passive righteousness, expressing itself through love, active righteousness. That's a pretty big statement for him to make. I mean, the only thing that counts, if the Apostle Paul were standing on this stage, okay, if he was sort of, you know, I don't know, zoomed down, and he was standing on this stage, And he said, now, I mean, if the Apostle Paul, I just want you to know, for the record, that if the Apostle Paul appeared on this stage, I would sit down in the front row and let him talk, okay? Um, 
And if he began his remarks by saying, the only thing that counts is, we would all be like, oh my gosh. I mean, what's about to come our way is gold. The apostle Paul is speaking, everybody shut up. And if he said the only thing that counts is faith, passive righteousness, expressing itself through love, and then he zoomed back up, okay? That's what counts. Faith expressing itself in love. That's what Luther meant as he made this distinction. The only thing that counts is faith, passive righteousness, believing that all accounts are settled between me and God because of what Jesus has done. I don't have to worry anymore about the way God feels about me. I don't ever have to wonder whether or not God loves me, whether or not God is pleased with me, ever, ever, ever. That is done, the sweatshop is closed. I never have to worry about that vertical relationship again and how God feels about me. It's done, it's over with. And if you don't believe it, read Romans 8 again and again and again and again and again. You don't ever have to worry about that again. So now that you don't have that to worry about anymore, you're now free to go, okay, you know, I can sing and I can dance and I can ask you what you need and do my best to serve you and to love you. Passive righteousness tells us that God does not need our good works. Active righteousness tells us that our neighbor does. So the aim and the direction of good works are outward, not upward. Now, that sounds relatively easy to understand. I get it. And I'm explaining it so clearly that you guys should all be getting it. Okay. Come on. That was funny. (laughs) Eric Metaxas had to ask you three times to laugh at his jokes today. Three times. I'm like, come on, guys. This is liberate, man. This isn't the gospel co- Uh, No, sorry. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. That was not a good work, by the way. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Just kidding. Um, But uh, it's easy to understand, okay, Uh, this idea that our works are not a transaction between us and God. Our works are in service to our neighbor, okay? It's, It's relatively easy to get that. But you and I know that um, not just our churches and our pulpits, but our hearts are filled with this idea that we must do, do, do in order to keep God liking us, in order to keep God's favor. I mean, we may never say it. I, I, I honestly can't think of a preacher or a pastor who would stand up and say, now I'm sure they're out there, okay? I have no doubt that they're out there. I can't off the top of my head think of a pastor or a preacher who would say, if you don't do these good works, God will stop loving you. But that's not the way that message gets across. It gets across when we preach these lifestyle instruction parts of the Bible and leave the impression with the hearer that if they do these things, God smiles. And if they don't, God frowns. If they do these things, God likes them. And if they don't, God hates them. Okay, we leave that impression. And the reason I know that is because not only do I travel a lot, but I've talked to lots of you. (laughs) Okay, lots of you write in to us and tell us your stories. You share, it's, it's amazing the stories that we hear from people all over the world, all over the world who say the exact same thing in a different way. This is the first time I've ever actually believed God loves me, and I've been in church my whole life. This is the first time I've actually believed, not just with my head, not just a verse that I could quote, but I actually believe and know in my heart that God not only loves me, but he likes me because of what Jesus has done. And these aren't letters that are just coming in from people in their 20s and 30s. We get letters from people in their 70s and 80s saying, I have been in church for 65 years, and I feel like I just became a Christian just now. And some of them may have just become Christians. Um, So 
That's how it gets across. It's, it's a failure to communicate clearly, not by articulating these categories, and every sermon needs to be articulating the categories of passive righteousness. Don't do that. I'm not talking about that. But communicating in a way that the hearer walks away with the impression that God, God's love is conditional, and we have to meet his conditions in order for him to love us. We have, you know, it's interesting. Um, I don't really have a problem uh, with uh, hearing the words, uh, God loves sinners. I, I don't disbelieve that. You know what I have a hard time believing? God loves me. Because I'm, I am the worst sinner that I know. I mean, I'm sure there are many in here who are way worse than me, okay? But I don't know your sin the way that I know mine. And I'm just kidding. I'm probably uh, pretty confident that I'm worse than you, but um, all of you. But uh, I, know, I know my sin. I know how messed up I am. And it's hard for me to believe sometimes that God loves me. I mean, it's just, it's hard. I have to always pray, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. I mean, I, I want to believe it's true, but it just seems too good to be true. I mean, if the people in my life, if everybody in my life knew the messiness of what I conceal in my own heart, they would run. You know that messiness, and, and you stay? And you love me in spite? That's just, it's hard to believe. And when we hear sermons or when we read books or when the focus of the Christian faith is presented to us as a conditional framework whereby we have to live a certain way and do certain things if we're going to keep God happy with us, it just, it just, um, it grows that fear and that insecurity inside of us. There seems to be. There seems to be, in certain circles, an absolute obsession with the false convert. And the preaching reflects that. Weary and heavy laden, blood-bought saints coming to church and hearing sermons from the shepherds of their soul and walking out the door wondering, questioning whether or not they're a Christian. You know what Jesus said about those kinds of people? It would be better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into a lake and drown than to lead these little ones astray. I mean, there is seemingly an obsession with providing Christian people with checklists that you have to look at because you may or may not, and they, Matthew 7, you know, there will be many on that last day who say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You know, you know, you know what the problem is there? The problem isn't that they did too little, the problem was that they did too much, <laughs> thinking that their doing was what, was what keeps God's favor. But that's precisely the way that some preachers preach and some writers write. They leave this impression to Christian people, people Jesus died for. Listen to me. If Jesus doesn't doubt your salvation, don't listen to a preacher who causes you to, okay? I mean, I've heard sermons like that before, and I go, Jesus... How dare you cause me to doubt whether or not I'm a brother of Jesus when Jesus doesn't doubt that? He bought me. And so we get these checklists that were called upon to look at our lives and examine ourselves. And I know Paul says examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. And when you examine yourself and you see just how messed up you are, and then you fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. That's where your assurance comes from. Your assurance never comes from looking in, ever. And <laughs> those who are falsely assured are the ones who only look in because they look at themselves and they think, well, I'm looking inside. Of course I'm saved. Yeah? Of course I'm a Christian. 
you're not looking hard enough. Okay, if, if, you're, if you're looking at yourself and concluding that what you discover is pleasing to God, you're not looking hard enough and you've cheapened God's law. Look up, look out, fix your eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, he is the one who alone can guarantee a not guilty verdict on that last day on your behalf. So the problem is that we are always confusing these two planes because our natural tendency is to secure our own rightness. We view good works as a way to keep things settled with God on the vertical plane rather than as a way of serving our neighbor on the horizontal plane. And because we keep confusing these two categories and making the way God feels about us dependent on what we do, we need to be constantly reminded that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. We need to hear over and over and over again that the sins we cannot forget, God cannot remember, and that though the accuser may roar of sins that I have done, I know them all and thousands more, my God, he knoweth none. We need to hear that over. I, I have that tattooed down my arm because every morning I need to look over and go, Phew. I hope it's true because it's permanently on my skin. <laughs> Before you get a tattoo, make sure it's true. Um, we need to hear over and over and over again that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that nothing can separate us from God's love, and that Christians live their lives under a banner that reads, it is finished. We need to hear over and over that the foundation of the Christian faith is not our transformation, but Christ's substitution. Okay, listen to me. The foundation and the focus of the Christian faith is not our transformation. The foundation and the focus of the Christian faith is Christ's substitution. In my place condemned, he stood and sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. That is where our hope is found. Not how much I'm improving, how I'm growing, um, it's not our, the focus and the foundation of the Christian faith is not our transformation. It's Christ's substitution, and we need to hear over and over and over again that the foundation of the Christian faith is not first living for God. I'm going to say that again, okay? The foundation and the focus of the Christian faith is not living for God. The foundation and the focus of the Christian faith is the glorious fact that in Jesus, God lived for us. That's the foundation, the focus. Now, once our hearts are gripped by the radicality of that amazing grace and the hilarity of that outrageous mercy, what happens? We start saying, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Blessed self-forgetfulness. But blessed self-forgetfulness, the freedom of self-forgetfulness is the fruit, not the root. It's not the foundation and the focus of the Christian faith. And I, for whatever reason, I can't remember this ever being explicitly stated, but it was implied at the very least growing up in churches and Christian schools and Christian churches and we went to a few different churches. Um, um, it was at least implied that the focus of the Christian faith was the life of the Christian. You know? It, the focus of the Christian faith was the life of the Christian. And that my living of this life and the success or failure of my living this life is what determines the way God feels about me. And I can't even begin to tell you, I was telling a group of people today that I grew up in a Christian home, I grew up going to Christian schools, I grew up going to Christian churches, I went to a Christian college, and I went to uh, an academically astute seminary. And I became an associate pastor at a large church in Tennessee. 
I was there for two years. I came down back home here to South Florida and planted a church and became a senior pastor of a church and was preaching for five years or so before I understood that the gospel was for me as a Christian, as a Christian. So why? I mean, seriously, why? What's missing? How could I miss this? I mean, I was inundated. I was surrounded by Christians my whole life. How in the world could I miss the glorious fact that the gospel was for me after I became a Christian? That the gospel was for Christians too? How could I miss that? Because what was taught over and over and over again at least implied was that the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian. And you needed Jesus a lot at the beginning of your Christian life, but as you grow, you need him less and less and less. You know that it's kind of like this is the way Christian growth, it was not explained this way exactly, but this is what I understood it to be. That Christian growth was, I'm getting stronger and stronger and more and more competent every day. That's Christian growth. That's not the way the Apostle Paul describes Christian growth. The Apostle Paul describes Christian growth this way. I'm becoming increasingly aware of how weak and incompetent I am and how strong and competent Jesus was and continues to be for me. In other words, according to the Apostle Paul, who said at the end of his life, I'm the worst guy that I know. Okay, I'm the worst guy that I know. This is the Apostle Paul, all right? Where this is, I mean, it's like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Martin Luther. <laughs> no, hold on. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's like right there. Then Martin Luther, no, scratch that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, Billy Graham. <laughs> then Martin Luther. And the only reason I, I, I don't, the only reason I had to say that is because my mom's sitting over there. And <laughs> she might get upset with me if I didn't say that, so. Um, but we're talking about the Apostle Paul here. The Apostle Paul, a guy who wrote half the New Testament and planted churches all over the world, and he says at the end of his life, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? He says at the end of his life, I'm the worst guy that I know. I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the least of all the saints. I'm the worst sinner I know. And what's ironic about Romans 7, for instance, is the fact that Paul's sanctification is exhibited in his acknowledgement of just how unsanctified he is. You know, pe people who are truly sanctified don't talk about how sanctified they are. Okay, they don't, okay? They, they don't. Um, they, they are constantly bemoaning just how much of a train wreck they are because as they get to know God better and better and better, they see themselves in light of who he is and they get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where they're flat on their back and the only way is up and they go, who will rescue me from this body of death, a wretched man that I am? Thank God for Jesus. Okay. Um, and so Christian growth is not what they told you it was. <laughs> It's not what they told me it was. It's not growth upward, it's growth downward. Robert Capon puts it this way, uh, who, by the way, if he was still alive, would be a staple at Liberate, um, a staple speaker, but he put it this way, the life of grace is, the, is like the life of a cripple on an escalator. You know, you're just, and you're not doing jack squat in the infamous words of Chris Farley, Jack Squat, okay? Um, I mean, we need to hear over and over and over again that the foundation of the Christian faith is substitution. What Ray was talking about earlier today, was Ray Cortez not the Mac Daddy? Where is he? Where is he? Thank you. You will be back. In fact, I want a commitment right now in front of everybody. I want you to say you'll be back here in 2016. Is he saying yes, no? He's avoiding the question. 
How many of you want Ray Cortese back in 2016? The Lord has spoken, my friend. I do too. Um, now, just in case someone will say, okay, well, if our good works are not for God, they're for other people, then why, why pray? Why, why read the Bible? Why listen to sermons? Why do any of that stuff? Why do any of the spiritual disciplines? As if our understanding of the spiritual disciplines is exposed when we ask the question. Because what it assumes is that we believed we did these things in order to keep God happy with us. So if we're not doing these things to keep God happiness, happy with us, then what are they for? I'll tell you what they're for. We don't do these things because these things increase God's love for us. We do these things because it's in those places where God reminds us that things between he and us are forever fixed. I call these things God's rendezvous points. It's at these rendezvous points where God reminds us that it is finished, that the debt has been paid, that the ledger has been put away, and that everything we need in Christ we already possess. And this vertical declaration forever secures us and sets us free to see the needs around us and work hard horizontally to meet those needs. So, freed from the burden of using biblical instructions to gain favor with God, we are now free to look at those instructions, not as conditions that have to be met in order to get more of God's love, but as descriptions and directions as we seek to love others. Do you understand that? You understand how important that is? I mean, when you read all of those portions in the Bible that talk about good works, there's pl all the imperatives, okay? Imperatives. I hear you preach indicatives. What about the imperatives? <laughs> all the, so let it be said, all the imperatives that are in the Bible are not there so that you have a clear roadmap on how to keep God loving you. God loves you because of what Christ has done on your behalf the vertical. They're there to direct you and to describe for you what love for your neighbor looks like, which is what the entire book of James is devoted to. I remember years ago preaching through the book of James as if all of these instructions were there in the book of James to make sure you do them or else God won't love you as much. I didn't say that, but that's the impression I left. The book of James is a horizontal book. It's showing you what love for others looks like. Showing you clearly and plainly. This is what love for your neighbor, this is what love for your neighbor looks like. Um, and so this distinction also helps us understand why it's important to fight sin. Someone might say, well, then why fight sin? You know, Paul tells us, fight sin. Put to death the misdeeds of the body. You know, put off the old. Put on the new. I mean, he tells us, you know, holy sweat, as the Puritans used to call it. I mean, what if this is true, you know? I mean, why? Why, why fight sin at all? I'll tell you why, okay? We fight sin, listen carefully to me, we fight sin not because our sin blocks God's love for us. We fight sin because our sin blocks our love for others, okay? That is a game changer, at least it was for me. We fight sin, which is why Paul compares the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. If you look at Galatians 5 and you read the works of the flesh and that comparison there, works of the flesh, um, all of those things are self-salvation projects. You know, all of the things the Bible speaks against, don't indulge in lust, don't indulge in greed, don't indulge in self-centeredness, don't lose your temper, all of these things, why do we do these things? In order to save ourselves. You know, I indulge in lust, I indulge in greed, I indulge in self-centeredness and all these things. Why? To save myself. I'm trying to find freedom and fullness of life by attaching myself to these things, attaining these things, pursuing these things. And, um, and what's happening 
to the people around us when we're constantly thinking about ourselves and what we need to do to find freedom and fullness of life. We buy into all of these counterfeit gods. We buy into all of these counterfeit versions of salvation, all of these things, all of these different avenues, because we're obsessed with trying to set ourselves free and find happiness and freedom and all of those things. And when we're obsessed in that way, what's being blocked? Well, our, our spouses, our friends, our colleagues, our enemies, our neighbor, we're not thinking about them and what they need. We're obsessed with ourselves. Lust, greed, blah, blah. All those are selfish. And so he says, you're saved. God says, you're saved. You don't need to worry about that anymore. All the freedom and fullness of life and all of the meaning and value and significance and acceptance and approval and love and love that you long for are already yours. So don't buy into those counterfeit gods and those counterfeit versions of salvation. They're, you already have the real thing. So now you are setting your you have been set free from needing to get those things yourself, and now you can serve your neighbor. Um, so we fight sin not because our sin blocks God's love for us, but because our sin blocks our love for others. So listen, the Christian life is not, and don't let anyone tell you that this is what liberate teaches, the Christian life is not let go and let God, okay? The Christian life is trust God and get going. And what I mean by that is trust that God has settled all accounts between him and you. That's the vertical, passive righteousness. Trust. Trust that God has settled all accounts between you and him. That you live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. Game over, period. And then get going in loving service to those around you in need. Um, To those around you that God has put in your life. You don't need, it's an amazing thing. What happens in a relationship when two people are going, everything I need I already possess, so now I can spend the rest of my life giving to you without needing anything from you? Does that feel like freedom or bondage? (laughs) It feels like freedom. You know when Paul says, when Paul's describing what a household should look like, you know, husbands love your wives, wives follow your husbands, children obey your parents, and, you know, I'm, uh, parents don't embitter your children. He's giving all these instructions and things like that. Um, what does a home feel like when those things aren't happening? When there's tension and fighting and blah, 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 and the husband's not loving his wife, and the kids are, you know, the, the, the kids are being embittered by their parents, and they're not honoring them. What does it feel like? Does it feel happy and free and every, no tension at all? It feels like hell, okay? I know because my house doesn't operate at all the way the Bible describes it, okay? Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Kim follows my lead infallibly, okay? (laughs) And my children have done nothing but honor us from day one. Um, So he's giving us what freedom looks like. You want to feel the freedom that's been secured for you? Love your neighbor. You don't need anything for yourself anymore, which is unbelievably liberating. So Luther said it this way, fruit of faith therein be showing that thou art to others loving to thy neighbor thou wilt do as God in love hath done to you. So let me just close with this. Um, And some of you have heard this. Let me tell you how functionally important this distinction is. Um... I have three children. Gabe and Gabe is my oldest. He's 20. Uh, Nathan is my middle child. He is almost 18. He'll be 18 in a couple weeks. And then Jenna is my daughter who is 13. And um, Gabe has always been, and let me just preface what I'm about to say by telling you that I got he and his new wife's permission to tell this story before tonight, okay? Just in case you're thinking I'm just, you know, uh, being insensitive to them. I actually checked with them first, uh, and they gave me the okay, and I pressed and said, are you sure I can come up with something else? And they said, no, that's fine. Um, I think his wife thinks that it would be a real help to people, and it would be a real sort of example of God's grace. I think Gabe's just so narcissistic he wants to be talked about, so he gave me his permission. Um, And that way, he's very much like his father. Um, So uh, Gabe has always been our highest maintenance child. 
And um, Gabe's pastor's here tonight, Martin, thank you. He's your responsibility now, buddy. Um, uh, and, um, and we had a really difficult time with him his senior year of high school. Like, it almost killed his mother and me. Almost killed us. I was a bad kid. Gabe wasn't nearly as bad as I was, but he was getting close. And um, we sent him away. He graduated from high school, and we sent him away to Africa that summer, the summer after his senior year. And I'd like to say I sent him to Africa to learn more about Jesus and to serve other people. I sent him to Africa because I wanted him as far away from our family as I could possibly get him, okay? That's how exasperated we were. Uh, But he went over there and served as an intern at a church and really came back different. And uh, he met Jamie, who um, just turned his heart in a remarkable way. Jamie is amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, I remember telling her a a while ago, Jamie, what Jesus was apparently incapable of doing in the life of Gabe, you have accomplished, so thank you. (laughs) Thank you. You help us sleep better at night because you are in his life. She's amazing. So uh, a a year and a half ago, uh, she goes off to college. He goes off to college, different schools. Uh, They maintain their relationship to come home fall break. Thanksgiving, Christmas, spring break. They come home last summer, they both work here at the church and they're just crushing it. I mean, they're just working in an amazing way. They're doing great work, everybody loves them. Uh, you know, just he lived with us this summer. I didn't want him to at first because I was afraid it wasn't gonna work out. I was, he begged to and I said, okay. And so he lived with us and I was really, really, really sad to see him go when it was time for him to go back to school. The year before when we dropped him off at school, I was like, Adios. Uh, if there's an emergency, call 911. Um, but this year was very different. Um, when he went back to school after summer break, I was sad. I really loved him being around. Um, and God had really turned him in a remarkable way. And we were so relieved by that. Well, a week after he got back to school, I'm at home by myself watching, it's like five in the afternoon, I'm watching Batman Begins. Um, Nathan's at football practice, Kim and Jenna are out running errands or something, and I get a text message from Gabe. He's been gone a week now, second year of college, been gone a week, uh, starting his sophomore year, and he says, Dad, it's the way he always starts his text. Yes, son, Um, I have something to tell you. What is it? It's bad. Okay. What? Dad, it's really, really bad. Okay, now, if you have kids and you've ever been on the receiving end of a text like that, everything inside of you collapses. Collapses. And so I said, well, honey, I have no problem being affectionate with my boys and calling them honey and all that stuff. So I was like, well, honey, um, I mean, tell me what it is. And he said, don't get mad. And I'm like, <laughs> just tell me what it is. What, what? You know? Um, and uh, he said, Jamie's pregnant. I just... I just collapsed. He was 19 at the time. We'd seen such a remarkable change in his life. And to me, this seemed like such a huge setback. And so I said, well, honey, how do you know? He said, Jamie just took a pregnancy test and it came out positive. I just got off the phone with her. I was the first person he texted, which I didn't see at the time. I look back now and see what a gift that is. Um, What an amazing gift that is. And, um, And I said, son, I said, buddy, um, if she is, then you're going to become a dad and I'm going to become a grandfather. And that child is going to bless you and Jamie the way you have been a blessing to us for the last 20 years. What he did not need to hear in that moment 
was a three-point sermon on the evils of fornication, okay? I mean, he didn't, he didn't need to hear from me all of the instruction passages in the Bible regarding the evils of premarital sex, okay? He didn't need that. What he needed to hear in that moment was, um, God loves you. Nothing you have done or confessed just now changes the way God feels about you. Nothing. Nothing. I, that was the last thing I wanted him to worry about. I didn't want him to worry about the way God felt about him. And it was this distinction. And you know what's so amazing? Twenty years earlier, I was 21, and my wife to be was 21. And we were engaged to be married, and we found out she was pregnant. And I was scared to death to tell my, I wasn't that scared to tell my dad, I was super scared to tell my mom. Um, <laughs> but we were brand new Christians, and I had put my parents through so much hell, and I didn't want them to get hurt all over again. And I pulled my dad aside, Kim and I went to see my dad, and we pulled him aside, and I just, I looked at my dad and I said, Kim's pregnant, and we both burst into tears, and my dad grabbed me with this arm and came with this arm, and he pulled us to his chest, and he said, don't worry about a thing. We love you, God loves you, and this child is going to be a blessing to you the way you have been a blessing to us. Whether he understood it theologically or not, my dad understood the difference between passive and active righteousness, between the law and the gospel, and how those things work, how those things function. This is important stuff because the last thing you want to do is to confuse these two planes and to talk to someone in that position, someone with that kind of a need, and lead them into believing that God loves them less because of their mess up. That sweatshop has been closed. Closed. And now I'm able to say, here's, here's how to love your, here's how to be a dad. <laughs> here's how to love your wife to be. And they are now married, Gabe and Jamie, and they got married here in this sanctuary. I performed the ceremony on December 28th. They are married. They are in Chattanooga going to school. Uh, baby comes in the beginning of May. I've already nicknamed the baby Payback. <laughs> PB for short, but payback. <laughs> Said, uh, I, I swear, people think I'm kidding. I'm like, son, your kids, your son, it's a boy, it's a boy. So your son's going to, it is a boy, by the way, but I said, your son's going to ask you at some point, why does Tutu, which is what my grandkids will call me, why does Tutu call me payback? <laughs> and you're going to have to explain to him why. And I can't wait to be there to watch you explain that. Um, but they're married. They're, I mean, it's like God has turned this whole thing around. And even though I never want to live through something like that again, it was the best thing that happened to my son. Um, and I can, God does that sort of thing. And to tell him and to be reminded myself, parents can go through an identity crisis in those moments too. Well, what did we do? This is not the script we wrote for our child. How did we screw up? What did we do? Was I too soft? Was I too hard? What, what did we do? We can begin to question whether God feels good about us when our kids mess up. Passive righteousness, active righteousness. It's functionally important. Listen, before God, the righteousness of Christ is all we need. And listen to me, before God, the righteousness of Christ is all we have. You live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. You don't need anything ever again. So now you are free to give everything.